Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast live uh, here on YouTube and on all your other favorite uh, platforms. I hope you're good. I hope you're well. Apologies for the technical issues at the beginning. I don't know what happened. Uh, my computer just went a little bit crazy um, sort of seconds after I'd hit the live button, but we are here now. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got plenty to get into uh, off the back of what was a really, really frustrating uh, evening for us uh, at Villa Park up in the Midlands. We'll get onto all of that. Um, we'll break it all down. We're going to talk about the officiating, of course. I know everybody wants to speak about that at the moment and is interested to hear uh, each other's takes on some of the decisions that unfortunately yesterday went against us. But I also want to focus on the performance as well, because I think there was a lot that Arsenal could have done in order to change the outcome of the game. I know some people have said, well, the performance was quite good, so we shouldn't be too downbeat about it and we shouldn't make too much of a song and dance about it. And I agree with that to an extent, but I also feel like sometimes, you know, we can get into this mindset of, you know, everyone's against us and and, and it can make us angry and it can lead to you spending your week just being frustrated. And listen, for the record, I think that Arsenal do get treated differently to a lot of other clubs. I feel like Arsenal are extremely unlucky with some of the decisions that went against us yesterday. I think that Mikel Arteta was extremely unfortunate. In fact, it's bordering on scandalous that he was banned from the touchline yesterday, having picked up a third yellow card for really and truly nothing at Luton. There's a lot of that as well, okay? And we're going to do all of that on the podcast, but I do want to focus on the football itself as well. I do want to focus on the things that were within our control and the things that we can do better as a team so that we don't find ourselves in a situation where we're relying on these fine margins going our way every single time. Big hello to everybody that's joining us in the live chat at the moment. Um, hope you've all had a good weekend so far, football and Arsenal uh, aside. Um, I just wanted to say a big, big thank you before we dive into all of the chat. Um, for everybody that sent me really nice messages over the last couple of days, um, I managed to um, do my first ever uh, Premier League commentary for Arsenal, for the club that I love. And it was amazing. Um, alongside uh, former Gunner and Arsenal legend Nigel Winterburn, uh, we did the uh, Aston Villa game together. You can, uh, if you're an Arsenal member, I think on the website and you've got access to the video player, you can go on there now and watch the entire game back if you so wish. You can also grab extended highlights there. Failing that, if you just want to check it out, uh, you can go on the Arsenal YouTube channel and you'll find a uh, very short highlights package there. And um, yeah, it was um, it was a really amazing experience. Uh, as a lot of you will know, I've done some under-21s games, some Premier League 2 games for the club in the past, but this was the first time I got the call up for a Premier League game. And I am going to be doing the Liverpool game as well. Um, I don't know if that's a good omen. I don't know if I should be doing it after what happened yesterday. I have to say, you know, getting that call up and sort of setting up ahead of the game and all the rest of it, doing all the sound checks, it was such a buzz. It was, honestly, it was such a buzz. And then the result goes the way it does. And I can't help but feel like, meh, like, you know, just like, it doesn't feel like that big a deal anymore. And and that's a shame because I was really, really looking forward to it. I'm extremely proud that I got to do it. Um, and I wasn't even going to post that I did it this morning. That's how, you know, kind of wrong it felt given the way that the game went. But then I thought to myself, no, do you know what? This journey has been amazing. And, um, and I've got to take some enjoyment um, out of doing that full stop. And I have to try and put the result... To one side. Um, so yeah, if you haven't checked it out already, please do let me know what you think. All your feedback is, of course, as always, uh, very, very much appreciated. Um, let's see what you guys are saying in the chat uh, before I start my ramblings. Daniel says, hello, Harry. Disappointing result, but some huge games around the corner. So we just need to regroup. How much do you think Arteta's touchline ban affected us? I think it had some effect. I think it will always have some effect. I, I said it in the build-up to the game when we did the preview show. I feel like Mikel Arteta, more than most managers, gives you 
a bit of energy from the sidelines. He's clearly very intelligent. I think he spots things and passes on instructions really, really quickly when he's down there. Maybe, and I'm not saying this was the case because I don't know that, but maybe, you know, the fact that he wasn't there on the touchline to be able to communicate directly led to, you know, a, a little bit of a delay because it has to go through the man next to him when then it has to go down to Albert Stoivenberg down on the touchline. And does AirPod Albert, as great a coach as he is, does he have that presence on the touchline that makes the players look over for him and maybe allows him to get their attention in a, a big stadium where there's a big atmosphere like that? I don't know. I think it would have had some kind of impact, but it's very, very difficult to measure how much of an impact. So, yeah, I'm not going to go too big on that. I think the fact that he was banned in the first place was, as I said earlier, scandalous. And we spoke about that after the Luton game. Um, but to say that that was the reason or part of the reason that we didn't win, I think is maybe pushing it a little bit. Um, although I do accept and acknowledge that it would have had some impact. James uh, says, good day, Harry. Happy to catch you live for the first time in a while. Very interested to hear your thoughts on the performance from yesterday. Don't worry. Uh, I'll be throwing them all at you. Big hello to Sammy. Um, we've got Dr. Pepper I love that drink. Um, he says, good afternoon, Harry. First time I'm joining the live. Love the pod from Perth, Australia. Welcome, mate. Good to see you. Uh, Patrick says, you are back. Yep, had a technical glitch at the start of the show. I didn't know if it was recording, if it wasn't recording. But anyway, uh, we got there in the end. A big hello to Boston, who joins us from across the pond. We've got Mario, who says, afternoon, Harry, mate. How have we not been given that go on for me? We just weren't clinical enough. Odegaard has to score the first one, is what it is. We move on so many games to play. Uh, we've also got Osuo Aboneni in the chat. Um, we've got Jack, who says, uh, Hi, mate, just don't think we've got quite enough in our ranks this season for the title. Our finishing is very poor. Don't believe we can win the title with Jesus and Inketia as centre forwards. Um, Mario says, uh, Always a great show. You do. Here's a little thanks. Thank you so much, mate. Really appreciate it. Big hello to Mafia Boss too. Um, Irfan Chowdhury says, lay it on me, big fella. Needs some simu words of wisdom. Arteta will most likely miss the Liverpool game with the FA still not concluding their investigation from the Newcastle game. I wouldn't be surprised if they dish out a ban um, as well very, very soon. Juno says, don't usually tune into Arsenal content after a loss, but wanted to say congratulations, H, on the commentary. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to come back to the chat box um, a little bit later on. Uh, we'll do that in a lot more detail and we'll spend a bit more time on it a little bit later on in the show. But for the time being, uh, let's get into the, uh, the chat around yesterday's game. And I do want to split this into two parts. So I want to get the officiating part out the way in part one, and then we're going to turn it on to our performance, what we could have done better. Of course, we'll do uh, some player ratings as well, which I'm going to make up on the spot, by the way, because I haven't uh, actually written these down yet. Um, so that should be interesting. And I'll maybe allow you guys in the chat to guide me. Right. Let's uh, focus first then on the officiating. Were Arsenal robbed? Were they treated unfairly? Were the decisions right, wrong? We'll get into all of that just after this. Welcome back to the podcast. Now, there were a number of decisions that were worthy of discussion uh, following our trip to Villa Park last night. So let's um, let's do that bit first. I want to start with uh, the Gabriel Jesus penalty appeal. Now, I have to be honest. Right. And uh, Arsenal fans are going to disagree with this. Arsenal fans are, are going to disagree with this. But I think that if a referee gives that as a penalty or if a VAR steps in to award that as a penalty, it is soft. And it's not the type of thing that I generally and take my Arsenal hat off for a minute. It's not the type of thing that I generally want to see penalty kicks given for. However, the frustration comes from the fact that we've seen those given time and time again. And this is where it all comes back to that point that I always bleat on about. Consistency is everything. Now, I understand, and I've said it before, that you'll never get 100% consistency across every game in the Premier League because you've got different officials, different circumstances, different players involved, and all the rest of it. I totally get that. But just four hours before, we saw Crystal Palace given a penalty for something incredibly similar against Liverpool. 
where the player managed to get his foot on the ball. He didn't bring it under control or anything like that. He got his foot to the ball and someone kind of hooked his leg from the back. And in the end, the VAR intervened that time and decided, yep, penalty kick. So that's where the frustration comes from around this. And it just feels like all those marginal ones that are 50-50 that are on the border, we're just not getting them. And it's irritating and it's difficult to take. And when you're 1-0 down, you become desperate and the need for something like that becomes heightened in your own mind. Therefore, you get more emotional about it. You get angrier about it. And so although I am saying that in the grand scheme of things, that probably would have been a soft penalty kick. The thing is, is that most other teams probably do get that. At least that's what it feels like anyway. So I understand the frustration around the the Gabriel Jesus incident. Then we've got the Diego Carlos yellow card, which undoubtedly 100% should have been a red card. And I'll tell you what really wound me up about this. Somebody within the team of on-field officials, whether that be the fourth, the linesman, or the referee on the pitch, saw Diego Carlos's action. How do we know that? Because Jared Gillett produced a yellow card. Then it's on the VAR to have a look and decide whether there's a potential red card there and whether there's uh, grounds upon which to upgrade that card to a red card and potentially send the guy off. How anybody has looked at that and thought that that was simply a yellow card is beyond me. It is violent conduct. It is. Diego Carlos looks, sees Enketia getting away. He will argue that he's putting his arm out to block him. That he's trying to, you know, give him a little, you know, a little bump, a little bit of contact to maybe potentially throw him off, maybe delay the run, allowing him to turn and get back. And defenders do that all the time. They use their arms all of the time. It's how it works. It's a contact sport at the end of the day. But the minute you glance over your shoulder, making you fully aware of where they are, and then you throw an arm that high in the direction of their face, you are asking for trouble. And how that has not been, A, seen as a red card in the first place, because as I say, somebody's clearly seen it because they've shown a yellow card. And how the VAR then doesn't step in is wild to me. That was, of the bunch, the worst decision, in my opinion. Then we move on to the goal, or the goal that never was, the goal that Arsenal thought they'd scored in the 90th minute through Kai Havertz. Should the goal have stood? I think the truth is that none of us want to see goals chalked off for nonsense like that. And where people get quite frustrated is it seems nowadays that a defender can accidentally handle a ball. Yet if an attacker accidentally handles the ball, it will lead to, if they do manage to put the ball in the back of the net, that goal being chalked out. And that is hard to get your head around. We either talk about, you know, just making the handball rule simple. If it touches your arm, it's no goal. Um, But then it has to work the other way because that's what it is right now, right? The rule is, and and by law, that's why they've not given that goal, right? Because his hand, Kai Havertz's hand, has touched the ball at some point, which impacted on how that passage of play played out and impacted on Arsenal's ability to score the goal. I'm okay with that. I understand that that's the rule. I think it's a crap rule. I think it needs re-looking at. I think it needs to be consistent across both sides. I think if you're going to give defenders the leeway of saying it can be accidental, therefore, um, you know, you won't always be penalised for that, or they do have that, yeah, that little bit of a, a buffer in terms of, you know, when someone kicks the ball at them and all the rest of it. I think you have to give something back to the the attackers as well. Because what you're essentially doing is you're eliminating goals and you are, you know, creating a game where there's going to be less goals. Now, we all go to football to watch goals. We don't go to football to watch two banks of four defending and people sort of booting it up the pitch aimlessly. We go to watch good football and we go to watch goals. And For me, something needs to be done about that. The outcome in terms of them not 
uh, allowing the goal to stand, I'm actually okay with. Again, and I'll tell you why, because as I say, although I think the law is a nonsense, that is what the law says. And I've seen that applied in other games um, and in other scenarios and under other circumstances, often enough for me to feel that at least generally they do that bit okay. But here's my problem with this whole thing. It's not the outcome. It's the process. Because the process needs to be right in order for us to get the fair outcomes consistently. On this occasion, I think Jared Gill is incredibly fortunate. And I think he's got away with this one. But why has he followed the process that he has? Why has he... And, and, and again, maybe this is a bigger discussion. Maybe this is not about Jared Gillett. Maybe this is about the VAR processes in general. It probably is, in fact. But just hear me out for a second. You have a look at where Jared Gillett is positioned when Kai Havertz and Matty Cash and Eddie and Ketia, if you like, are in are in um, are involved in that incident and in that moment. Okay, you have a look at where he is. First of all, he's miles away. And second of all, he has got an Arsenal player standing directly in front of him. How on earth, given that we needed to watch seven or eight replays to try and figure out whether or not it came off Kai Havertz's hand, how on earth has Jared Gillett from that distance with a player standing directly in his eye line decided no goal? How's he got there? He's guessed. And the problem is with this guessing game, is that you then impact on how the rest of the process plays out. Okay, so let me let me sort of break this down in a little bit more detail. If Jared Gillett is not sure, he needs to let the goal stand. He needs to let the goal stand and then contact the VAR and say, who will be checking it anyway, by the way, he needs to contact the VAR and say, guys, there's a suspicion of a handball there. That's my suspicion. So I'm going to let the goal stand, and now it's over to you guys to check that. Because I'm not having that he was 100% sure. He guessed. Now, you could argue that referees have been guessing for years. Yes, but we're no longer in the position where they need to guess. Back in the day, we didn't have VAR. We didn't have all the technology. You had to make a decision there and then. You'd guess some of them. Sometimes you'd get it right. Sometimes you'd get it wrong. But there's no excuse for that in the current day. And there's no excuse for that with the technology that we have available to us. So Jared Gillett, for me, should allow the goal to stand. And then there should be a conversation with regards to his suspicion of a handball. And that should then be followed up by the VAR. Now, the reason it needs to be done that way around is, is this. If you give the goal, then the VAR's job is to find definitive ev evidence, just like we suffered at Newcastle, of a reason for that goal to be chalked off. That's what the VAR's remit then is, okay? So the VAR will look at that. And although I think they probably still would have come to the same conclusion, they are going into it with the mindset of, okay, that's a goal. Now I need to see something that tells me otherwise. So you're going into it with a different mindset. Whereas when the referees made an on-field call, which is no goal, then the, the officials who are all a team, who are all a unit, what's their mindset going into looking at the replays then? It's, well, my mates called it as a, as a handball. So um, let's look at this as closely as we possibly can. Let's scrutinize this as much as we possibly can. Let's look through all of it with a fine tooth comb until we find something that justifies Jared Gillett's decision, which protects and looks after our mate. Can you see how the two mindsets are different? One mindset, if the goal stands, is, okay, it's a goal. Can I see anything clear and obvious for me to overrule that? Maybe they still come to that same decision, but you don't know. But the mindset is different. The psychology of it is different. The other mindset is, ah, he's ruled that out. We need to find a reason to back him up now. Th this is where I struggle with this whole thing. So by law... I'm OK with the final outcome, but I'm not OK with the process and I'm not OK with the way this is being applied. And listen, when you're on the, the wrong end of marginal calls, 
as we've been. You know, we've had two defeats in the Premier League this season. One was at Newcastle, where anybody with any sense could see that we were, you know, we were robbed. And the other one was at Aston Villa, where, again, I think just about on the balance of things, those decisions are probably correct. But when you're on those margins all the time and you feel like nothing's going your way, plus your manager suspended for a load of nonsense, you start to think to yourself, hold on a minute, what the hell is going on it? What the hell is going on it? So you can understand why people are feeling the way they feel. But that's my bit on the officiating. I don't want to talk about that anymore. I want to go over to the performance because I think there's a lot to unpick from that as well. Uh, just before we do that, Ronnie, there's a Tottenham fan in the comments. Ronnie says, why are Arsenal fans so arrogant? I want to know why Tottenham fans spend their Sunday afternoon watching Arsenal podcasts. But anyway, uh, I guess that's another one for another day. Right. Um, short pause. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the performance because I think there's a lot uh, that we need to discuss here as well. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. I hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Thank you uh, for joining us for part one. Now it's part two. Um, if you are joining us late on the live stream, you can rewind it back and have a watch. Uh, if you're listening on audio, uh, please don't forget to leave us a review. You know the drill by now. Okay, let's talk about the performance. Going into the game, and I said this, I think, pre-Luton, I wanted to see Alexander Zinchenko taken out of the side and I wanted Tommy Asu to play at left back. Now, of course, Tommy Asu picked up an injury against Wolves, which meant that he was unavailable for Luton, which is why Jakub Kivior played there. Um, but obviously Arteta had the same idea about the defensive weakness that we have with Zinchenko, hence why he put Jakub Kivior in. Okay. I'm not going to criticise Arteta too much here because I do genuinely believe that had Takahiro Tomiyasu been fit and available, that he would have played at left back because Mikel Arteta has done that on a number of occasions this season against certain opponents. So, you know, I'm OK with that. I think that there's not really a great deal the manager could do. You could argue that maybe he played Jakub Kivior yesterday at Villa Park. But I've got to be honest, I'm not totally convinced by Jakub Kivior as a left back. I think he's a good centre back. I think he's someone who's going to get better and better, all the rest of it. But would I have thrown him in at Villa Park yesterday? Probably not. But you need to sometimes play smarter and you need to um, make sure that you are as aware of your vulnerabilities as your opponent is and you looked at the way that Villa performed against City in midweek. You looked at Leon Bailey in particular on that right-hand side and the field day that he had coming in onto that left foot of his. The fact that Yuri Tielemans was getting really close to him. You looked at all of that. And for me, that set alarm bells ringing about what we were going to do at left back. And, and it was clear to me, as we discussed in the preview, and I think to a lot of other people, that left back was the problem position. So what do you do? You need to protect that position a little bit more. How could, in hindsight, and it's easier to say with hindsight, I know, how could Mikel Arteta have protected that left-back position a little bit more? I think he could have played Jorginho in the midfield. He could have sacrificed Kai Havertz and he could have played Declan Rice on the left side of that midfield, a position that he's played in uh, on multiple occasions this season, done a really good job there, with a focus on at least for the first 20 minutes, half an hour, just making sure that we protect ourselves against that vulnerability that we clearly have. Instead, Arteta, you know, he only made the one change. It was Zinchenko uh, coming back into the side, Kivi or out, which meant that Kai Havertz continued. Listen, I thought Havertz was okay again. It's not about Kai Havertz. It's about the tactical aspect for me. But I thought that Mikel Arteta could have set us up slightly different in order to try and deal with that problem. But the same... You know, while I can say all of that, I think that we were a little bit naive as well because our press was super aggressive from the off. And did it need to be? One of the things that I've praised Arsenal for this season is recognising that actually at times you do need to drop off a little bit. You do need to play the game slightly differently. So for me, you start the game and you keep it compact and you keep it tight and you don't need 
to be pressing as aggressively as we were in the first 10 minutes. You're away at Villa Park. They've got the bit between their teeth. They're in wonderful, fantastic form. You need to ride out the early storm. And we didn't do that. Why? Because we pressed way too aggressively. And credit to Aston Villa, because at the time, I don't think I appreciated how good a goal that was. The way they played through the press, right from the back, all the way through the team. That's the kind of goal that Unai Emery would have been dreaming of the night before. And they go and they score it with with John McGinn and all the rest of it. And all of a sudden, we've got our backs against the wall and we've got an uphill battle on our hands against the side that are full of confidence and um, and against a side that, you know, people are talking about now as title contenders. Let me just say, Aston Villa in my book are not title contenders at this moment in time. And I'll explain why. Unai Emery played really, really high-risk football yesterday. I can't remember the last team that played us with such a high line. I don't even think Man City played us with such a high line. We should have been picking them off with ease. An Arsenal side that is clicking, an Arsenal side that is at its best with a sharp Saka, a sharp Martinelli, a sharp Jesus, who maybe has played one game too many having come back from that injury after international duty a Martin Odegaard who's firing, a Kai Havertz who's firing. They pick that defence off time and time again. Do you know who else would have been a big help in that sense? Thomas Partey. Obviously, he's not available, but that was the type of game that he would have relished. You know, the game being played in a small, compact part of the field. Um, But the reason we couldn't take advantage of Villa's high line and the high-risk football and make them pay for it was because the final pass was more often than not off. Um, The timing of the runs in behind was off. And that's where you need to start making runs from deeper positions. Use your um, your forwards to to sort of occupy the defenders. And then you need to start pushing your uh, Kai Havertz's forward. You need to start pushing your Martin Odegaard's forward. Because if they're coming from deeper, the likelihood of them being caught offside is less. So I think we needed to tweak that and, and do that differently from earlier in the game. Having said that, at half time, after um, you know Martin Odegaard missed what I think was the best chance of the half, the one where it was laid off to him by Jesus, he took two wonderful touches, set himself, but just seemed to telegram to Emmy Martinez where he was going to put it and make it really, really easy for the keeper to save it. And Martinez, a good penalty stopper, notorious, he's good at reading people, and he was able to get down to his right and save. But even at half time, I kind of went in at the break thinking. Okay, we're losing. It's not been great. It's not ideal. But we are going to create chances. We are going to create more opportunities against these because of the way that they're playing. And all we need to do is pull ourselves together, be a little bit more composed, be a little bit more patient at times. Because I thought at times, having gone 1-0 down, we were trying to force the issue, which was leading to us playing balls too early when people weren't back on side and all the rest of it. But I was quite confident at that stage that we could then go out and score an equaliser. But it just didn't happen. The second half, it it wasn't good enough from Arsenal. You know, it it just really, really wasn't. Saka wasn't as impactful as you want him to be. You know, they were kicking lumps out of him and obviously made that substitution to bring Moreno on. So somebody else could kick lumps out of him at a latter stage in the game. Martinelli was nowhere near effective when Leandro Trossard come on. I thought he was pretty average yesterday. Um, You know, we thought we had our moment on the 90th minute, but obviously uh, VAR intervened and all the rest of it. I just think that we can sit and we can talk about the decisions and some of them are, are, are certainly worthy of a conversation, but the truth is Arsenal weren't good enough. They lacked that cutting edge. And although I'm as frustrated as anybody else by some of the decisions and, and some of the the lack of the rub of the green, if you like, that we get. I just think to myself, we can only control what we can control and we can control our level of performance and we can control whether we're sloppy or not. We can control the timing of runs, the timing of passes. We can control all of those things and we just didn't. We just didn't. So although we can talk about those other bits and pieces and those other elements, I think for me, the performance is the big point here. And it was a good performance up to a certain point, like Arsenal were dominant away at Villa Park, 60 plus percent possession, more attempts at goal, all the rest of it. 
in that sense, it was good. But it was that final bit. Once we entered that final third, we just did not have a clue what we were doing. And when we got into those situations, nobody had the composure. Nobody had the the minerals, if you like, to take the ball on and do something on an individual level. Um, and it just became, yeah, a, a slog towards the end. And in the end, the game petered out and Aston Villa... Um, you know, barring that one moment where we thought we'd score with Kai Havertz, actually had a relatively comfortable time. But anyway, um, those are my thoughts uh, on on uh, the game yesterday at Villa Park. Um, I'm not going to do uh, a Q&A at the end of this one, just because um, I do want to watch the Arsenal women's game, which I know is, is underway at the moment. But we'll do an extended Q&A on tomorrow's episode of the podcast to make sure that we make up for it. But if I give you my player ratings before... Week. I wasn't uh, expecting to be rambling on as long as I was there. Um, let's start with Raya. Um, I'm going to give Raya a six. I, I don't think he did anything wrong yesterday, to be honest with you. Um, but I don't think he was outstanding either. So six is about right. Um, for Ben White, I think I'm going to give Ben White a six as well. Um, Saliba, I'm going to give Saliba a six and a half. I'm going to give Gabriel a six and a half too. I thought he had to clean up Zinchenko's mess way too often. And actually, if you go back to the Villa goal, as good as it was, I actually think that if Zinchenko isn't the one that commits the way he does and he doesn't get turned and, and played around the way he does, then Gabriel can come out to that wide position maybe just a little bit later, which then impacts the whole shifting of position of the back line, which means that maybe we have another body. Maybe Saliba is closer to McGinn as well. And a combination of him and Ben White could maybe try to stop that shot. And I'm not saying they would have, but I just think the fact that Zinchenko gets caught out in these situations, it it's the trigger for Gabriel to go out and it comes sometimes too early and that leaves us vulnerable. Um, Zinchenko for me, I'm going to give Zinchenko, this might sound harsh, I'm going to give him a four. I just think defensively he's so bad and when he doesn't dictate the game either, you wonder what he's doing in the side. Um, Declan Rice, I'm going to give Rice... I'm going to give Rice a six and a half as well. But a lot of that is because I think that Rice just had too much to do. You know, he was playing against a top midfield. And a lot of the time he was doing it on his own. And that's my worry with the way we're utilising Rice at the moment. That we're relying too much on him to hold an entire midfield because we're too attack minded in other areas. That's another reason why I'd have played Jorginho alongside him. OK, not the most mobile, but positionally very disciplined, very good at retaining possession. And that might have been uh, the better way to go. Odegaard, I'm going to give Odegaard a four. Nowhere near creative enough. Gave the ball away sloppily at key moments. Missed the two best chances that we created in the game. Um, chances that he'd normally score. And um, yeah, I was disappointed with his performance. I think he was too, judging by sort of his words uh, post-match. Kai Havertz, I'm going to give Kai Havertz a, a six and a half. I thought he battled well. I thought he fought well. Obviously, he was very, very unlucky not to score the equalising goal. I love that bit of needle from Kai Havertz that we saw yesterday. You know, he cares. He wants to do well. He doesn't like being bullied. He doesn't like being pushed around. He doesn't like people getting in his face. Six and a half for me. Um, moving into the forward line, I'm going to give Saka a five. I thought he was distinctly average yesterday. I don't think he caught, created anything. Martinelli... Um, I'm going to give him a four along with Zinchenko. I thought our left side was really disappointing generally. Gabby Jesus, oh, this is a tough one. I'm going to give him a five because of his work rate, but again, completely ineffective in comparison to what we've seen in um, in recent weeks from him. So yeah, tough one to take. Difficult um, defeat to stomach, but you know it is what it is. We go again on Tuesday. PSV Eindhoven, I expect there to be changes to the team for that one. Um, and then, of course, we go again next weekend against Brighton and Hove Albion. And that, with the trip to Anfield to come after it, becomes a really, really big game all of a sudden. So, um, yeah, imperative that we get three points on the board for that one. OK, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all so, so much for joining me. Remember, we'll do an extended Q&A session on tomorrow's episode. I'm going to go and watch the football now. Um, I will catch you all soon. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for all your well wishes again. And I will catch you all on Monday. Until next time, goodbye.